Hey guys, how's it going? Welcome to Evening Devotion. It happened again. A video did not upload. Namely, yesterday's Evening Devotion. Now, I caught him this time. I caught him. YouTube sent me an email about my 2022 year in a view, singing my praises of how good my channel did. And my channel's a no-name channel, so it's all fluff. But if that's the case, why are they not allowing my videos to upload? Because last night, I checked twice. And the second time that I checked was before I went to bed. And I leave you, the YouTube page open so that I can come back later and check if I need to. And it was uploaded. So I don't know what's going on. I don't know what happened. Powers that be doing something they shouldn't be doing. You know what? It's okay. Still got to see the video. The video still got to be posted. We're going to still keep pushing forward. <clears throat> Whatever they want to do, however they think they're trying to slow me down. Which is really funny that they would go after a channel as small as mine. I'm one of the smallest channels out there that do what we do. It must mean I'm a threat. It must mean I'm doing something right. If they think that I'm somebody they need to pay attention to. I love it because what that shows me is that shows me we're on the right track. <coughs> Excuse me. That shows me we're going the right direction. So, tonight, we're going to be reading out of Hosea 5-7. And it literally just dawned on me as I'm looking at the screen here, reading Hosea 5-7. And the words of this partial verse here, I realized that particular event and that story actually applies right with this. Let's go there. The whole verse says they have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. Now a new moon shall devour them in their heritage. Mm, strong. One, two, three, four, five. Let's see here. Okay, we'll start right here at the beginning in verse one. Punishment coming for Israel and Judah. Now this is direct addressed to Israel and Judah, but this has far-reaching implications to the rest of the world as well. Hear this, O priests. Take heed, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king, for yours is the judgment, because you have been a snare to Mizpah and a net spread on Tabor. The revolters are deeply involved in slaughter, though I rebuke them all. These are his covenant people he's talking to. Now, at this particular phase, they are in the state of unbelief. So, in my opinion, reading this, and as we go through, you'll see more of this evidence, this is also addressing the unbelievers of history. Because they do the same thing. I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you commit harlotry. Israel is defiled. They do not direct their deeds towards turning to their God. For the spirit of harlotry is in their midst, and they do not know the Lord. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Therefore Israel and Ephraim stumble in their iniquity. Judah also stumbles with them. With their flocks and herds they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn himself from them. They have dealt treacherously with the Lord, for they have begotten pagan children. Now a new moon shall devour them in their heritage. Blow a ram's horn in Gibeah, the trumpet of Ramah. Cry aloud at beth Aven, Look behind you, O Benjamin. Ephraim shall be desolate in the day of rebuke. Among the tribes of Israel, I make known what is sure. The princes of Judah are like those who remove a landmark. That's bad, and that is a direct reference to what's going to happen in the future in the seven-year peace agreement. When they move the landmarks. I will pour out my wrath on them like water, like a flood, maybe. Ephraim is oppressed and broken in judgment because he willingly walked by human precept. Now you're starting to see how it's extending out to all of history. Human precept. Therefore, I will be to Ephraim like a moth, to the house of Judah like rottenness. When Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah saw his wound, then Ephraim went to Assyria and sent a king, Jerob, Sorry, and sent to King Jerob, yet he cannot cure you, nor heal you of your wound. For I will be like a lion to Ephraim, and like a, like a young lion to the house of Judah. I, even I, will tear them and go away. 
I will take them away, and no one shall rescue. I will turn again to my place, till they acknowledge their offense. Listen, till they acknowledge it. You agreeing with God that your sin is sin is a great way to move forward in faith. Then they will seek my face. In their affliction, they will earnestly seek me. In their affliction. Now you guys see what purpose affliction plays in a person's life. And I already love the first sentence. Believer here is a sorrowful truth. And it is a sorrowful truth. And there are many sorrowful truths in the Bible, but they are truth nonetheless. We don't have to like it. You can be floating in the ocean being eaten by a shark and not like the fact you're being eaten by a shark. Still being eaten by a shark. Just because you don't like it, it doesn't change. We take these sorrowful truths and we apply them and we believe them and we trust the Lord in them because these things are warnings to cause us to flee to him and not rely on our own devices. Thou art the beloved of the Lord, redeemed by blood, called by grace, preserved in Christ Jesus, accepted in the beloved, on thy way to heaven. Wonderful, wonderful words. But he adds an and yet. So we have these wonderful words. He's talking to Christians, believer. Thou art the beloved of the Lord redeemed by blood, called by grace, preserved in Christ Jesus, accepted in the beloved, on thy way to heaven, and yet thou hast dealt treacherously with God, thy best friend, treacherously with Jesus, who thou art, whose thou art, treacherously with the Holy Spirit, by whom thou hast been quickened unto eternal life. This is going to be a powerful devotion that might hit a lot of people right in the heart. Or as somebody who's commenting on some of my videos, it might hit you in the feels. How treacherous you have been in the matter of vows and promises. Do you remember the love of your espousals? That happy time? The springtime of your spiritual life? Oh, how closely did you cling to your master then, saying, He shall never charge me with indifference. My feet shall never grow slow in the way of his service. I will not suffer my heart to wander after other loves. In him is every store of sweetness ineffable. I give all up for my Lord Jesus' sake. Has it been so? Alas, if conscience speak, it will say, He who promised so well has performed most ill. He who promised so well has performed most ill. Prayer has oft times been slurred. It has been short, but not sweet. Brief, but not fervent. Communion with Christ has been forgotten. Instead of a heavenly mind, there have been carnal cares, worldly vanities, and thoughts of evil. Guys, this applies to every single one of us. I heavily include myself in this. Because each one of us, to whatever degree it may appear, can go and look at ourselves and examine ourselves and see much of this. I can't sit here and exclude myself from this, and I'm not going to. And nobody else should be able to do so either. We're human. We make mistakes. I had somebody here recently comment on an older video talking about being sinless, and I shared scripture with them showed them the error of their understanding per scripture. Instead of responding and standing up for what they believed in, they deleted their comment. That's the norm for people who don't actually believe what they say. You guys hear me speak here. You see the scriptures. I believe what I'm reading and I believe what I'm saying. Instead of service, there's been disobedience. Instead of fervency, lukewarmness. Instead of patience, petulance. Instead of faith, confidence in an arm of flesh. He's quoting scriptures. And as a soldier of the cross, there has been cowardice, disobedience, and desertion to a very shameful degree. Thou hast dealt treacherously. Treachery to Jesus. What words shall be used in denouncing it? Words little avail. Let our penitent thoughts execrate the sin which is so surely in us. 
treacherous to thy wounds, O Jesus. Forgive us and let us not sin again. How shameful to be treacherous to him who never forgets us, but who this day stands with our names engraven on his breastplate before the eternal throne. So, when I read this, who clicked away? Because it hit them so hard in the conscience they couldn't take it. Who became offended that they are typing up a comment in contradiction to what I'm saying? Who was so struck by this that a sudden flood of memories of their inadequacies and inaccuracies came forth? I raise my hand with you. See, I cannot exclude myself from any of this because I am just as guilty as everyone else. In fact, more so. Because it is my quote-unquote duty, it is my desire, it is my drive to set the example. And I live with the knowledge of knowing that I fail daily. I'm not happy about it, but I know it's the truth because the Word confirms this. We have an entire history of a people written down in a book that we look to every day, we should be anyway, if my conviction has worked. If the message I was given has taken hold, we should be in the Word every day, at least a little bit. A people chosen by God who did exactly the opposite of what he said, and yet they still have the covenant. They're still people of the covenant. How amazing. What can this do for us? Well, if you're a believer and you're saved, there is no losing your salvation. Jesus made this very clear. But he makes two very curious statements, very condemning and very convicting statements. On that day, referring to the day of judgment, the day of the Bemacy judgment, many shall suffer great loss, but they shall be saved. And he says in another place, some shall enter heaven like one escaping the flames. You're barely making it to heaven. And I believe this will be the state for a majority of Christians. This may be the reason why so many had to die for their faith. Not only was it that they were being taught, but that was what it was going to take to push them fully to him, seeing that there was no way out of their situation and that their human pride could serve them nothing and they would be forced to turn to God. See, the negative things in our life don't necessarily have a negative outcome. They actually sometimes, and in most cases, I believe, have greater positive outcome because they send us where we should be. Reposition us. Sometimes you can help somebody up onto the path. Sometimes you got to shove them. And the Lord knows this. He knows how hard-headed and hard-hearted we are, just like Israel. So for anybody listening, if you have excluded yourself from this, you're making a big mistake. You're just as guilty as everyone else is. I just want to make that clear. You don't have to like it. It's the truth, and the Bible makes this clear. So what should we do? And like I told you guys in January, like I've been reminding everybody all year, this is the year of encouragement. How? And somebody will right away say, well, how is this encouraging? It's encouraging because it is encouraging to you to make sure you're standing in the place of the Lord. It's encouraging to you to examine yourself, like the Bible says, to see if indeed you are in the faith. Encouraging because it causes you to be challenged to overcome the things of this life, the distractions, the inadequacies, the struggles. To overcome your own lack of faith. To overcome your own deceitfulness. Not, you're not deceiving him, you're deceiving you. Your own behavior, your own disobedience. Every one of us in some way is disobedient. It's the truth. Here's the great thing that I learned. Once you come to that place where you accept that, the guilt goes away. Once you come to the place where you realize, you know what, I I'm not, even, even though I'm saved, even though I believe, even though I see the evidence of this, I, I still have problems. I'm not perfect. And I'm not going to be. Here's what it did for me personally. It sent me more to him. Lord, I need you more than I realize. And Lord, I know I'm going to make mistakes. And I will confess that to you. And I pray Holy Spirit does too when I'm not in prayer. And I need you to put me on the straight and narrow and keep me there every day because 
I struggle. I'm weak. And I will always be so until you finish the work you started in me. It is a wonderful day when a believer finally gives in to the sharp sticks poking them in the heart and agrees with God what sin is and that they have it. Many people consider themselves sinless. I don't know how you can come to this conclusion because the Bible tells you very clearly you are not. Otherwise, why would Jesus have to die for you? If you could be sinless, we would just all go by the law and be sinless. But what, what, um, what rules are you using that to gauge that sinlessness by? God's? Because if that's the case, it's impossible. What criteria are you using to declare yourself sinless? Because the Bible says, if you violate one part of the law, you violated the whole thing. That means if you hate somebody without a cause, you just committed murder, according to Jesus. Thou shalt not kill. Did somebody give you too much change and you kept it? Now you're a thief. Thou shalt not steal. Did you look at a man or a woman in a, in a tight outfit or even an attractive outfit meant to show a lot of skin and have impure thoughts, lust after them? Thou, has, has, thou shalt not commit adultery. Are you Wiccan, yet calling yourself a Christian? Are you doing yoga? You guys know what yoga is. I've done videos on this. A little bit of research will terrify you when you realize what that really is meant to be. It's not just exercises. There's a whole lot more behind it. All the yogi instructors over there in Pakistan and India and all that laugh because we don't know what we're doing with this, and they do. And yet call yourself a Christian. There is no such thing as Christian yoga. It's evil. It's demonic. Everything about it is. Thou shalt have no other God beside me. Thou shalt have no idols. Do I need to keep going? See, everyday life has aspects of it that cause us to violate these commandments. And here's the wonderful encouragement to all of my brethren. In Christ Jesus, you have forgiveness of these things. Because much of this is everyday life. The apostles told the Gentile Christians, uh, don't eat anything offered to idols or, you know, don't ask for conscience sake, but if I told you what some restaurant chains who are the big corporation ones, ones that you go to weekly maybe, what they did behind closed doors and what their company model for the inner group, what it was involved in, you would realize that everything that they sell is offered to idols. Well, the Lord said not to eat that stuff. Don't ask for conscience sake. Because if I told you that, you wouldn't go to fast food restaurants anymore. Any of them. Any of them. There are very few that are not on that list. It is terrifying. It's terrifying how much of this life is oriented around demonism. You think the palm reader is okay? Demonism. That's something that was taught thousands of years ago to women by the Nephilim. You think the herbs and the incense and the burnings and all that, they, oh, it's, here, burn this. It, it's a free money spell.com thing. It gives you more money, you know. Yeah, that's all demonic. The crystals, demonic. Now, right away, somebody will say, oh, you're just saying everything's demonic. Have you done research into it? Because I have, and it's demonic. When you see where it comes from, it's demonic. Do you know where the word for the day of the week Wednesday came from? <coughs> Do you know what it represents? And now go see there's a TV show about Wednesday Adams. Why do you think they named her Wednesday? A family who is into witchcraft and sorcery. Demonic. People worship Saturn. Demonic. It's in the Bible. 
Remphan, the star of Remphan, and Shiun. It's in the Bible. It's in the Old Testament. It's demonic. If I sat down and put it all on video, and I have not done it, I've only shared key things. If I sat down and put it all on video, you would almost never leave your house again or interact with anything or anybody again because you would realize just how much of this world is wrapped up in demonism. It is shockingly terrifying how much of it is satanic. What do we do? This is where we have this wonderful forgiveness in Christ, this grace that covers us in these times. Now, the great thing about 2,000 years ago is they had very little interaction with others. They could, they could literally stay home. But in this day and age, you must deal with this world that has this ivory soap. Who, who uses ivory soap? In the late 1980s, the... CEO then of the company that makes ivory soap was on a TV interview on a national mainstream channel admitting their upper 5% of their company as a corporation are all practicing devil worshipers. Still want to use ivory soap products now? Check out the label and start Googling the names. You'll realize almost every soap company is owned by that same company. That's just one. That's just one. Shocking. You start to find out that most of the products you use are owned by a small handful of big giant corporations. And they are in bed with some of the most evil and terrifying individuals in this world. It's shocking. It's terrifying. But here's the here's the terrible truth about this. The sorrowful truth. We're all involved in it. Now, can that be held against us? Not necessarily. Especially if you're don't ask for conscience sake like it says in in the Bible. If you don't know, you don't know. I can tell you safely, I have not used ivory soap since I heard that interview. But I know there's other products I have made by the same company. So there's almost no way to get around it. Again, if I told you that what the, what's the key main fast food chains who were involved in and who owned them and what that was all, that's all food sacrifice to idols, it would terrify you. It is terrifying how deeply entrenched we are in this evil world as believers. We are living in a foreign land, a foreign country. We are not members of this nation. And this is why we should live as much for the Lord as we can. And when we discover these things, eliminate it as best we can from our lives. You can't do it completely because Satan has permeated every single aspect of life. Satan is called the god of the power of the air for a reason. What do you think that means? And there are a lot of people watching that don't know. What is the power of the air? It's not the wind. What else travels through the air? Radio waves, TV waves, FM, AM. And where do you think he transmits most of his deception? Through those same exact airwaves. Do you have internet? travels through the air. No, mine comes through a cable on the ground, but how do you think it gets to the cable? Travels through the air to way stations. They do not run that much miles of cable underground. Travels through the air. Don't believe me? Look it up. I did. And I was distraught when I found all this out. And the more I found out, the worse it got. To the point that I almost quit doing videos on this channel. I saw no hope. And the Lord showed me. You can't save yourself from it, but I can save you from it. And I will. So though I know, back to what we started with. Though I know that there are things that I do that cause me, in a way, to deal treacherously against the Lord. Some of these things can't be helped. It's the world we live in. We are in enemy territory. So it's 
It's normal. The Lord deals with that by his grace and mercy. The things we can deal with are the purposeful ignoring of the words of the Holy Spirit. <coughs> the purposeful disobedience against the word of God. Those things we can help. Those things keep us from dealing treacherously on purpose against the Lord. Sometimes, all of a sudden, a passing thought hits you. Ah, again! Why can't I stop this, Lord? I can't keep myself from it. It's like everything I look at reminds me of this. And instantly, these thoughts come in. And I don't want this anymore. What do I do? How do I stop this? Because I can't. That was a real conversation I had with the Lord in my pickup truck on a back dirt road, screaming at myself because I hated it. I still hate it. You know what the response was? No, I did not hear it audibly. The response was scripture. Nothing formed against you shall prosper. Neither death nor life Height nor depth. Angel, demon, human shall separate us from the grace of God. And it is his grace that sees us through these things. What we can control is our purposeful denial, our purposeful disobedience, our purposeful turning away from his word. That we can work on. That we can change. Because we can look at his word and go, okay, Lord, this is what it says. I'm going to take you at your word. That's what I'm going to do. If I make a mistake, fix me. Show me where I made a mistake and so I can change it. So that I can honor you in this. Because I certainly can't do it in anything else in this world. See, it really, is, it really is a struggle to live in this world knowing what we know, doing what we do, and dealing with what we deal with. Did you know, <clears throat> now not, I don't know about the brand new Subarus, but did you know Subarus that I know of from about 1999 on up to near our time, I think 2015, that I, last I saw. On the rear differential cover, because it's an all-wheel drive car, on the little differential in the back on the rear, they've got a pentagram in the molding of the aluminum of the differential. I've owned several Subarus. I found it on every one of them, and I looked at that, and I thought, I'm seeing things. I wasn't. There is a pentagram, the demonic symbol for Satan, on the rear differential of those cars. How can I have a car knowing that this kind of stuff goes on with these car companies? And they hide this stuff everywhere. You know who else has it? Ford, Dodge, Mercedes, Volkswagen. Volkswagen was a company started by Hitler. <laughs> Can't get more evil than that. You better believe I took a tool and ground that off of there. Now, it's not going to do any good. It doesn't change what's going on. But that's the stuff there. Now, I don't know there's people out there right now that are like, I got a Subaru, and they're going out crawling under their cars, looking. Bottom left corner, by the way. <clears throat> that's where I found mine at. We can't change that. God changes that. He deals with that. That's why judgment is coming. That's why wrath is coming. To deal with those things. He's been quiet for 2,000 years. Saving that wrath up for that moment. His cup overflows with it. How do I know it's 2,000 years? Because he poured it all out on sin, on Jesus. It's been filling ever since. We can't change that. We can't affect that. We can't get away from that. We're stuck here right now. What we can do is read his word and do what it says. When it says do right, we do right. When it says believe, we believe. When it says walk in truth and in faith, we do that. When it says trust, we trust. What it tells us to do, we do. To the best of our ability. 
And that's not lurk. It's not works. It's not front loading, back loading, side loading, top loading, bottom loading works. I love when they say that because it sounds so silly. It's not doing anything with works. It's doing what the Bible says. Be a doer of the word. Well, being a doer doesn't mean sitting in a chair doing nothing, thinking about it. It means getting up and doing something. It's verb. It's active. Be a doer of the word. You must actually trust in the Lord. You must actually believe. You must actually walk in truth. Walk in truth doesn't mean sitting in one place, doing nothing, contemplating it or meditating on it. Walk in truth tells you that you need to be about your daily life and business in truth. It's a verb. It's active. I run into people weekly now. It used to be daily. I run into them weekly now. They have such a horrible misconception of what the Bible is really saying because they listen to other people who don't know what it says either. Instead of reading it for themselves and looking at what the scripture says. That's why I have people that comment. In fact, just the last couple of days. And when I share what the Bible says with them, they delete the comment instead of responding. Why did you do that? Why didn't you respond? If you really believe in what you're saying, why didn't you respond? Oh, that's right, because you don't read the Bible and didn't see that. That's purposeful denial of the word. That's dealing treacherously with the Lord. Just one example. Guys, what do we do? Now, you guys know. Y'all are listening. Y'all have been along this ride for a long time. You know where I stand on this. Don't believe anything I say. Test it. Test everything. I have yet to find but maybe two or three other people out there that are doing content similar to mine that will tell you, don't believe me. Test it. Look at the scripture and test it. Everybody else expects you to believe what they say. Wrong. I am fallible. I am sinful. And I walk in the same level of disobedience as everybody else does. But here's the difference between us and the rest of the world. Here's the difference between us and false professors. Here's the difference between us and the believers that are knowingly and purposefully ignoring God. We see the truth and respond to it. We see the truth about ourselves and we agree with God about it. That changes the dynamic so greatly. If you have two believers standing side by side, both with the exact same sins in their life, both with the exact same ideals, but one denies there's something wrong with it, denies there's anything wrong with that, and the other one says, Lord, I have this, and I agree with you, this is sin, and I can't stop myself, I, I need help. The difference between them two is as far as the east and the west of the universe. Even though they're right next to each other. Even though they're both identical in every way. But that one, that sets you apart. That makes you different because you look at yourself and go, this is a mistake. I'm doing the wrong thing and I struggle with this all the time and I hate it. But you acknowledge that that's what that is. The others don't. This is the problem. This is dealing treacherously, treacherously with the Lord. Israel has always worshipped God. But then they did the wrong thing by worshipping other gods in place of them. Or at the same time. They said, less than God as their standard. They dealt treacherously with them. One God and one God only. One Lord and Savior only. One Holy Spirit only. They are the ones you worship. They are the ones you latch onto and hang onto. They are the ones you walk in. So I'd like to read the first couple of, of this first main sentence again of this devotion, if you all would indulge me for a minute, and then I'll close. Believer, here is a sorrowful truth. Thou art the beloved of the Lord, redeemed by blood, called by grace, preserved in Christ Jesus, accepted in the beloved, on thy way to heaven, and yet thou hast dealt treacherously with God, thy best friend, treacherously with Jesus, whose thou art, treacherously with the Holy Spirit, by whom thou hast been quickened unto eternal life. And that's all of us. And we can deny it, but it doesn't change anything. That's all of us. Lord, we ask that you show us our inconsistencies. Holy Spirit, we ask that you convict us of these things. Make us to see where we are making the mistake and stumbling and falling short. 
Anywhere that we need to grow, anywhere that we need to change and be better, Lord, I pray you take what's bad out of us. Don't tear it out. A jagged edge seals up. Cut it out cleanly. So all of it is gone, just like a tumor, just like cancer. And put in us what should be there. An uncontrollable desire for truth. An undeniable desire for the word of God. Your word. An overpowering sense of love for all. And a devotion to the truth and to integrity. Lord, we make mistakes every day. We are engaged in some of the most horrible things. Um, thank God most of us don't know about it. And there's a lot of it I won't share. Because it would really wreck your life. But Lord, you know the truth. You know where our hearts are. You know what our driving force is. You know what our desires are. You know. Oh, what a great title for that video. <laughs> you know who's yours and who isn't. Lord, I pray that we are yours. I pray that we are locked in. Even if we stumble, even if we make a mistake, that you come and pick us up and carry us back. Tie us to the fence if you have to so we can't wander around anymore. But Lord, it's hard. And I'm, I'm going to speak on the behalf of all my brethren out there. It's hard living in this world and doing things the right way. It's hard to constantly be butting heads against this world because sometimes we just got to keep our head down to survive. But you always provide for us. You always stand in the gap for us. You always make intercession for us. Lord, please keep doing that because we need it. We sin. And I have to agree with you. We sin every day. We struggle every day. It's a fight every day. That's why so much more. I hate this world and I hate what it has turned into. And I hate living here because this is not my home. This is not our home. We have a different home. But I think us living in this world is a great opportunity for you to show all the more grace and mercy, thereby bringing glory to your name, which we glorify your name now. Well, this is a great opportunity to cause us to love this world so much more, less, and to love heaven so much more. More. I said that on purpose. Lord, have mercy on us. The things that we struggle with and can't get out of, I pray that you have mercy and forgive us of those. And the things that we need work on, our Lord, I pray you teach us. Continue to work on us and to finish what you started. So that on the day of redemption, it will be the least amount of work to finish it. But no matter what, Lord, your will be done in all things. No matter what, your will, your desire, your truth, always to be forefront in everything. And just help us to honor you in that, in this life, in any way we possibly can. To glorify you as we walk in this life and to exhibit faith so that when you come, you do find faith in the earth. You do find truth, even if it's a minute amount. You do find it. And Lord, this ministry, you know, that's what I'm attempting to do is that we can at least stand in as great amount of truth as we can. And all I ask is that you help us to see it, and to live it, for you. In your name, Lord, I ask all these things. Pray your will is done no matter what. We love you and we thank you. Amen. Guys, thank you for joining me for Morning Devotion. I will be making sure this video uploads. If I have to babysit that thing all night, I will. I'm going to make sure it goes up. But listen, don't let these things get you down. These are truths that we have to accept. Don't let them bring you down and cause you to doubt your salvation. Instead, make them to be a driving force to cause you to examine yourself more. Now, in your examination, you may find things you can't change. You may find things that are going to be a struggle, or it may be because of the type of life that you're living. You are trapped in these environments. Rahab the harlot was still a harlot, and yet she was considered righteous by the Lord. Why? Because she walked in truth. So it's clear by reading and looking at the people in the Bible who were called righteous, how they were still, they still had issues. Lot had an incestuous relationship with both his daughters, living in a place where it was homosexuality all the time. That place is still a flat lump of ash to this day. They've been out there excavating. They've got, there's, there's millions of skeletons out here. God killed five, he destroyed seven cities total. 
Five cities, the city of the plains, wiped them off the face of the earth and then left them. You'd think rain would wash this ash away. Well, in 3,000 plus years, it hasn't. That's an example to the world of what happens when people deny God and do the wrong thing. But what did he do when he found those imperfect Christians who were righteous? They were righteous in spirit, righteous in heart. He saved them. He will save us too, even though we're imperfect, even though we struggle, even though we there may be things in our lives we just can't get over and can't get out of. And we hate ourselves for it. He still shows mercy and grace. His mercy endures forever, as the Psalms say. He never changes, as we talked about this morning. Beautiful. Beautiful. Brothers and sisters, read the Bible every day. I don't care if even if you just dedicate a verse or two before bed, something to close your day with. Even if it's watching these videos, but I pray you go read the scripture I share with you. It's different hearing me say it and even seeing it on the screen than you making the action to open that book and to look at it. Or open your app and look at it yourself. Meditate on it. Contemplate it. Prove everything I'm telling you. Don't just take it for granted. Because in the end, those who were his are the ones who are desperately hanging on by their fingernails onto the promises of God, trusting him for those things, believing him for those things. Even though we are depraved and standing in the bottom of the pit, he will save us. He will redeem us. He will come for us. According to the world and the way things look, not, it's not too far off. So, so don't let these truths bring you down. Instead, make them be a motivation. Make them be a strong motivation. I love you all very much. I bless you all in Jesus' name. And I'll see you in the next video.